Welcome to our podcast, The Magical Holistic Healing Arts, where we are going to interview all different types of practitioners with all different creative magical modalities to really help us take care of our sacred body temple. And as always, we have our magical elixir, Kangen water, which is ionized, alkalized, hexagonal, micro, micro clustered water. Whoa. <laughs> Let's hear about that. Um, what I want to say most is that your brain needs water to really function best. And uh, the Mayo Clinic, which many of us have heard of that, um, it says you need nine cups of water a day just to stay alive. Just to stay alive. So that's it, nine cups. Um, when you are losing more water than you're taking in, it creates dehydration. And what do you know about, what do we know about dehydration? Well, if you work out, you need more than nine cups. If you drink alcohol, coffee, or soda, you need more than nine cups. If you live in high elevations, which I'm adjusting to. So it's been working really great for my mom just moving here to Colorado. She is able to acclimate to elevation way quicker with this water. Yes. If you're sick, you need more than nine cups. If you're overweight, if you take drugs or medications, um, I already said if you work out, if you're depressed or anxious, if you're stressed, and if you're in brain fog, they're all signs to have to be more hydrated, to drink more water. So that's why we're on this mission to share our Kangen water, because we've learned a lot and we really want to help people learn how to care for themselves in easy ways. Which, what a better easy way than just to change the water you're drinking. And we are proud distributors of Kangen water. So if you are interested about any of this ionized, alkalized, hexagonal, microclustered water, check the links below to get more information about this magical elixir to our lives. For today's episode, we have Ambika Waters, and she has so much magic to offer to this world. She works with oracles, angels, homeopathy, chakras. I'm going to let her get into it. So, Ambika, describe what your magical art is to the world. Well, I'm a homeopath. That's alchemy. The magic of homeopathy is alchemy. Really taking the pain, suffering, loss, and misery that people experience with physical, emotional, or mental uh, imbalance and turning that around with natural remedies made from plants, animals, minerals that are diluted in homeopathic dilutions and letting that work in people, letting it work in animals, letting it work in agriculture or in your garden. And restoring vitality that's magic don't think it's not it's when you see that happen when you see people's lives turn around it's a wonder it's a wonder with minimal interference with minimal dosage it takes a lot of work to become a homeopath you really have to understand human nature you have to understand nature so i love it i've been a homeopath for over 30 years I was trained in england I uh, stayed there for 10 years and uh, became a writer, became a published author. And when I came back to America, I came to where you are now in Longmont, Colorado. And I loved it. It was very grounding and very healing for me. And I put together a course, which I'm now teaching. It took me 20 years to write the book. And the book is called The Life Energy Medicine Bible which I'll show you in a minute, and teaching a course on connecting the energy systems of the chakras with homeopathy. But I'm also an artist, a trained artist, and uh, that's something I really love. It's very sacred to me. My art is, when it calls me, I, I listen and I go do what's called upon me to do because there's not a lot of time for it in my professional life so i love painting okay. and i only paint angels i don't paint anything else that's all that comes through just endless magnificent beautiful angels wow. and i think life is pretty magical itself i don't think you have to be have to do something to find the magic in life there's 
it's all around us all around us i mean we're right now we're in this pandemic and people are terrified i don't want to say rightly so because i don't believe that i think that the illness it's is the fear the fear just lowers the immunity it diminishes our capacity to make wholesome choices for ourselves the fear is gripping people and it's paralyzing their their souls and that's that's the illness that i see so to to not be in that state is to find what is magical it's a good question <laughs> find what's magical and what what makes your heart sing what um was your journey to all of this? <laughs> a long journey. <laughs> in 1998, I came back to America after 30 years abroad. I traveled. I lived in places for long periods of time. I lived in Spain for almost 20 years. I lived in England for 10 years. And in between, in Spain, in between the 20 years in Spain, I lived in Africa for seven years, on and off, um, going in and out. And I got very ill, got very, very ill after coming out of Africa with, um, I took a medication for a cerebral malaria that was going around and it really made me ill. I lost about almost 50 pounds. I was hemorrhaging and I prayed a lot. I met an acupuncturist who came to the a village near where I lived and had acupuncture for um, twice a week for almost a year. Got me back and um, went to England just to have a trip with a friend of mine and was at a dinner party sitting next to a homeopath. But I just knew he was a healer. He had wonderful energy. And I said, what? Well, what do you do? Are you a healer? He said, I'm a homeopath. I said, can I come see you? And he said he had come from South Africa, so he knew Africa. And I said, I was in Africa, and I got very, very ill. And I just, you know, I'd been in recovery for a year. He said, oh, yeah, come and see me. <laughs> so I did. And he gave me remedies that really put me on my feet. Wow. And I thought, wow, what is this? This is magical. This is magical, you know. To be able to not sleep 14 hours a day, to just to be able to digest my food, to put weight back on, to smile and laugh with people, just ordinary small things. And it really impressed me. And my life was in flux and I had to make some choices about what I wanted to do with my life. And I chose to go to Britain and study homeopathy. So, I spent 10 years there studying, writing, developing, learning to stand on my own two feet, financially, mentally, spiritually. It was a huge, huge period of growth. When you're in it, you don't know how much you're growing, but it was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really expanding. Yeah. So I, I started in homeopathy. Um, and I lived in the Lake District of England, which is an incredibly beautiful part of the world. It's where uh, Wordsworth wrote his poetry, where Turner painted. It, it's just got a light that's extremely beautiful. And my neighbor was a very well-known homeopath, as it turned out. So he ran these tutorials and he said one day, you can make a homeopathic remedy out of anything I said, anything? What about color? He said, color? I said, yeah, you just said you could make a homeopathic remedy out of anything. He said, well, why don't you do that? <laughs> okay. I'd had one weekend at homeopathic college, and, um, <laughs> and I started to have these lucid dreams about I could see beakers of water on... Um, sitting on mirrors, surrounded by mirrors and, and celluloid gels on top, different colors. And at the same time that I was contemplating how to do this, um, the homeopathic journal published an article by an Irish homeopath named Ula Niesing. And Ula, who I've never met, but I did read her articles, had also been given 
of remedies through lucid dreaming. She came up with a remedy for butterfly, a remedy for granite, where, which is particular to where you guys are right now because those Rocky Mountains are nothing but pure granite. And she found out that granite was a remedy that could be used for hard stony tumors, inoperable tumors. So it's, that's been an incredible remedy over the past 30 years to help many people. So I read it and I got really inspired that I could do this. So on the day of minimal light, the 21st of December, when I say minimal in the north of England, I'm not joking, I got minimal light. It was very gray. It was about four hours of sunlight or daylight, not sunlight. There was no sun. It was daylight. And I made these, got pure water, put them in the little beakers, put them on mirrors, surrounded them by mirrors, put the celluloid on top and put them on a tray and stuck them out in the light. And I didn't know if I had anything. So you fix when you do anything in water, when you make any remedies in water, you have to fix it in a couple of drops of alcohol or brandy. That's how flower essences are made, as you know. And so I did all that and I, I didn't know if it worked or not. So I asked two of my mates to come over, two guys who lived in the same area I did. And I said, okay, fellas, would you try this? And they said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I took a brief history. You have to find out how people are before they take a remedy. And one guy said he was very happily married. He'd been married for 12 years, and he never fought with his wife. And I said, never? He said, no, no, we have a perfectly compatible marriage. <laughs> so I gave him pink. I didn't tell them what I was giving them. <laughs> and the other fellow was the mountain climber. Very rugged, very rugged fellow, and very physical, uh, not not very open emotionally, but uh, very physical. He could climb, you know, anything. And he was born in the Lake District, and um, he grew up there. Very rugged people, very robust people. So I gave him each a drop. I, I gave the second guy, um, I think I gave him indigo blue. And... I got a phone call the next morning from the fellow who'd been married for 12 years and never had a fight, but had a fight that night. He said, well, we had our first fight. I said, oh, really? That's interesting. And he said, but something else. He had, he had a patch of eczema in the crease of his arm, on both arms, before he came and took the remedy. And it had cleared it up. It completely disappeared. But the fight was more interesting to me that these people who had really were closed off emotionally to conflict, not that it's a good thing to be open to, but people have conflicts and they had a fight. And that that's told me it worked physically and it worked emotionally. Mm. And the other guy, um, he ha didn't have very much confidence very, very low on confidence, emotional confidence, going out and meeting a girl and getting to know people socially. He was very closed, very quiet, but very physical. And he started a relationship with somebody. So I also lived near the largest Manjushri Buddhist uh, center in the Western world. It was five miles from where I lived. And after this, these two guys told me there was something there in the, in the medicine, I went to the Buddhist center and I asked for volunteers what we call approving. Can you prove this for me? Can you take a dose? And I got five volunteers. And so I took their case in the homeopathic fashion because you really need history. You have to be able to compare before and after you've given the remedy. So I had one gal who was very short and very stocky, very overweight. She was about five foot two and like a square. I mean, she was just big. She had one of the most winning spirits I've ever met in my life. And she suffered from rheumatoid arthritis. So I gave her also indigo blue. And 
that was the color I was proving. That they, none of them knew the remedy, although some of them were so clairvoyant, they'd hold the remedy up to their forehead and they'd say, this is blue. <laughs> and I wouldn't say anything, but I was like stunned. But these people all shared the same practice. They ate the same food, drank the same water, had the same daily meditation. Their lives were very, very, um, some would say narrow, but very inward. So they were very self-aware. And there was a young guy, he was in his mid-twenties, who um, was going to take or the order of becoming a, a Buddhist monk. And he had a lot of fear, very little confidence in himself. There were things he was really afraid to do. And I asked him, like, what are you afraid of? And this place was near the sea, near cliffs. And he said, well, some of the guys here, they just go and they dive off the cliff when the when the waves come in, like it's, it was a 20, 25 foot drop into the water and very cold water, cold water in the Irish Sea. Yeah. And he said it terrified him. So the nun, she was the first person I interviewed after she took the remedy, I went back four or five days later. She broke out in boils along her liver meridian all the way down to her toes, big, painful boils, but her rheumatoid arthritis was no longer paining her. Wow. So it was a detox, huge detox through her liver. And she loved the remedies. <laughs> she, she loved them. The boy who was afraid and low, low on confidence, he went and he dove off the cliffs. And I said, Wow, anything else? And he said, listen to this. He said, yes, this week five women fell in love with me. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> I beg your pardon. He said, yes, five women came into my life and just wanted to have a relationship with me. They were not in the, they were not Buddhists. Anyway, he wound up deciding that he was going to go to London and not take vows. I saw him nine years later. I ran into him at a, at a Mind Body Spirit Festival and he was married and had three kids and he was really happy. Mm -hmm. So his life changed dramatically. He got confidence and he was confidence for life, we call it. And so that was like, it put me on this path, but I wasn't a homeopath. I, I didn't really know my medicine and I had to complete stuff. It took me seven and a half years to complete my studies mm -hmm. and uh, present these findings to the Society of Homeopaths in Britain and to qualify for the Society of Homeopaths. It was just a long, arduous training. I mortgaged my house three times to pay for the training. It was, you can't say it was easy, but it was, it turned me into the woman I am today. Put me on my feet, gave me confidence that I could take care of myself that I could do what I needed to do. And I was a stranger in a strange land. The Brits, they, I once said, how long does it take to become friends with you people? And they said, well, about 10 years, that they were friends for life. I thought, wow, really? So it's not like the five minute wonder of being your be next best friend like we have here in America. So it was a lot of growth, a lot of growth. I wrote my first book, second book, third book, fourth book, fifth book there. And um, you can, once I started writing, once I got into my menopause, I started writing, you couldn't stop me. And I had a homeopathic teacher who once said, when a woman goes into menopause, she becomes more creative than she ever imagined possible. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you just couldn't stop me writing. And when I felt I was ready, I came back to America, and I came to where you are now, <laughs> which is funny. Yeah. Colorado. God bless it. God bless it. Yes. Yeah. Very nice, very safe, very sweet place. So show us some of your books. This is the Homeopathy Bible, and it's uh, got the color remedies in here. It's a beautiful little book with helps people understand the remedies. The color and sound remedies are found in, well, I've got two copies of it. This is Healing and Health with the Homeopathic Color Remedies. This is the most recent edition. It's in its third edition. This is an old copy of it. And it's 
If you really want to know about the color and sound remedies, this is where you look. A book that's been a great bestseller is Chakras and Their Archetypes because I take the chakras, I associate negative and positive archetypes, color, meditation, prayer, stories, cases. And my most recent book is an oracle deck called The Angels of Light. It's got a book and it's got these cards of angels that I've painted. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. And I'd like to share the story with you if, if I have time about how these cards came into being because to me they bring a nice message to the world. Wow. So I've been on my own for since I was a young woman and I've always been able to take care of myself doing my healing arts work, whether it was massage or healing or bioenergetic therapy or homeopathy. I've always been able to pay my way. I never, never made tons of money, but I always was self-sufficient. And a few years ago, about, mm, about five years ago, the doors started to close in. There was no work and I had to draw off my savings and I wound up with no savings at all and wondering what God wanted from me. What was I meant to be doing on this planet? Because I only I had worked for over 30 years in the healing arts. So I thought, well, maybe I'll go to Africa and work on an AIDS project, homeopathic AIDS project, because there are several of those now. But I owned a home and I didn't want to turn it over to the bank. So I really thought, okay, I'm going to try and sit this out, and I don't know what comes. I had a friend who offered me a job walking dogs in the foothills. So for two hours every morning, I'd get up and I'd go up to the foothills, which is incredibly beautiful here in Tucson, and I'd walk little dogs and see snakes and, you know, coyotes and beautiful, beautiful landscape, and it would really inspire me. And I sat down one day and I said, Whatever's going to happen, nothing's going to ruin my happiness. Mm -hmm. I will not compromise my happiness for money, for a person, for anything. So that was a big decision. And then I had to say, okay, well, what makes me happy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I, I got the philosophy. Now how do I apply it? And I thought, well, painting, painting makes me happy. And I had um, been associated with some artists uh, from the Waldorf School here in town, who showed me this way of taking the primary colors, watercolors, and putting them down on wet paint and then seeing what formed. So I went into my studio and I started throwing colored water, watercolors onto paper, wet paper, and going back the next day and seeing these angelic forms. And it just kept coming and coming. These angelic forms were they're just beautiful. You can see some of them behind me. Yeah. And if you're listening to our podcast, head to our YouTube page to see all this beautiful work and books that Mbika is sharing with us right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for doing this. This is lovely. <laughs> anyway, I would just go in and I'd fill in what I saw with gold and silver and a little crayon and that was it. I had maybe 50 or 60 paintings when a woman came and said, I hear you're doing angels. I'd like to get your work into an exhibition at this very famous gallery here in town. And so I did, I learned to frame, I you know, did the whole thing, but I didn't enjoy it. I did not like the exposure. It's hard to place angels, you know, that there's a lot of contemporary art, but do angels fit in, in the gallery? Well, they did, they did, but I didn't enjoy it. So I, um, I looked at these paintings, I thought they'd make a great oracle. I had done an oracle deck called uh, the Angel Oracle that sold 2 million copies worldwide and 14 languages. So I knew something about it. I taught a course at Naropa on how to, how to make an oracle. I had two other oracles out, but I'd never done the art. I'm very good at writing, but I'd never done the art. So I sent these pictures to my literary agent in London. and She said, yes, I'm going to try and move these for you. She took them to a publisher that we both know, and they loved them. So this has gotten into print, came out in, first in French and then in English. 
about a year ago. But the message of this is not just beautiful paintings and a nice oracle. The message is really, when things get bad, pull your finger out and become creative. Find what it is that makes you happy. What do you love doing? And do it. Because that will lead you to the next big step. And really don't give up. If so many people are so many people are in despair right now with the epidemic and the economy and just the state of the world. The angel of hope, the angel of grace, the angel of goodness. I'm gonna just pick a card. Oh, I was gonna ask yes. you to do that, so <laughs> yay! This is the angel of spiritual exploration. Rainbow. Rainbow. Find what it is you love and do it. Just do it. If it's working with people, if it's working with babies, if it's working with animals, if it's working on the land, find your heart and listen and trust your goodness, trust your guided to do something bigger and better than you ever thought possible. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Oh, that's a beautiful message. Yes. Um, you know, it's it's lovely as our journey of interviewing different people and really what they're offering because this time we need this inspiration and yes. And to hear stories of people of how they've gone or when like you said you a couple mortgaged your house. These things are going to be very apparent to a lot of people right now. So Absolutely. you're your advice is huge, um, yet it's it's almost scary, though. Were you afraid? I mean, I, you know, we all want to make the choice to enjoy life. It's your choice. It's up to you. You can. It's not just the glass half full or half empty. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. You want to be happy? Do you want to? Do you want to become a victim of the world? God no. Who wants to be a victim? What a bore. <laughs> There's nothing more boring than. Because you have to constantly reinforce that. When you let that go and you choose to live your life and be happy, you don't have to do anything. Life just flows through you. There's nothing you have to do to be happy. You can't do anything to be happy. Just say, I choose happiness. I choose the good. It doesn't mean you don't deal with your own stuff that never stops coming up. You know, use the remedies. Use the gifts that are, there's so many gifts people have now. You know, you two, you both have become creative in this wonderful thing of allowing people like me to express their truth. Thank you so much. That service, that is service. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. This is how people learn. And the internet has become this amazing gift. Who knew? Somebody said, it's not a luxury, it's a tool. Mm. It's a necessity because it's how we get connected. It's how we stay connected. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Mm. Amazing. Well, I guess, should we go into the chakras and archetypes? Sure. The, the chakras are what I call the ladder of love. And they are the energetic symbol for our vitality, our immunity, our consciousness, we start with the root chakra being grounded in life, the most basic things of health and um, stability, uh, security, uh, the right to your own life, the structures that you put in place to live your life, and patience. The bottom line on the root chakra is patience. And I fill these chakras in with divinities, like I put the Virgin Mary in the root chakra she's the mother of heaven and earth and i put in the archangel michael i put in the great hindu god ganesh for the root chakra i love these i love the indian hindu uh, gods and goddesses and i love the archangels and i love the divinities then for the sacral chakra which is above it the color orange that each chakra has its own symbols its own stories its own qualities so the qualities of the sacral chakra are your right to health beauty and resiliency abundance wealth and to thrive where you are 
unconditional love, forgiveness and gratitude, and pleasure, ultimately your right to pleasure, which is about delight and ease. And I put in the Christ there, Christ as the Lord of Karma, with the um, Archangel Metatron and Lakshmi, the goddess of health and prosperity. So they're all there together. And then the solar plexus, which is below the diaphragm in the area of the stomach, the color is gold or yellow, and the qualities are self-worth, self-esteem, confidence for life, your ability to manifest everything you need and want, from toilet paper to perfect health and prosperity. I'm bringing up toilet paper because people are having trouble manifesting <laughs> And this is the this is the represents the Holy Spirit, the Archangel Uriel and the Indian goddess Kali, who gets rid of what doesn't serve. Mm. Out, out, out. So this this is great energy. And finding your self-worth and your self-love is it's everything. Then we go above the diaphragm and we have the heart chakra. The color is green for the heart protector and pink for the heart, pink or gold. And this is what I call the, the seat of God. This is where God lives in us. The archangel is Raphael. And I put my name there as the goddess, my goddess, Ambika, is in there. You put your name, Lynn and Erica, you put your name in there. With me. Yeah. <laughs> God works in you. God works in us all. This is the holy of holies. This is the heart chakra. This is where love comes in and moves out and heals the world. So you can spend a lot of time at peace and at rest here. Then we have the throat chakra, which is turquoise, and uh, the qualities are truth, both your personal truth and the higher truth of God, creativity, clear communication, and willpower, because you need willpower to be able to say, no, that doesn't work for me. No, I'm not going to take drugs. No, I don't want to smoke. No, I don't really feel like alcohol. No, this person is way too negative for my, my peace of mind. Or no, this just isn't going to work out for me. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to create that. I believe that. We need to be able to use our will. So those qualities are represented. This is called the mouth of God in metaphysics. The ability to speak from our heart from our mind and to transform the world through the word. In the beginning was the word. I just met a wonderful uh, writer who's written a book called The Alchemy of Voice, Stuart mm -hmm. Pierce's book. And he's somebody you might want to interview in actual fact. He's in London and he was the voice coach for um, Diana, the Princess of Wales. Mm -hmm. And he's just come out with a book called Diana that you can find on Amazon. And he is all about the voice, all about the voice. And he, um, he worked at the Royal Shakespeare. He's just a fabulous, fabulous representation for the throat chakra. So then we get to the brow chakra and its qualities are wisdom, discernment, intuition, vision, mm. and knowledge. We need these things to go forward. And that is the realm of pure consciousness. It has no god or goddess or divinity. And then the crown chakra, which is really the light of Christ, that comes through us. And, you know, we're in this time where we've just had Passover for the Jews. We've just had... Easter for the Christians and Ramadan starts this coming week for the Muslims. So it's a powerful time. It's a vortex. Buddha's birthday, the first full moon, or the second full moon after the, the equinox coming in May. This is a vortex. This time is a vortex. You know, this pandemic did not hit us at Christmas. It did not hit us for summer holiday or Thanksgiving. It hit us in this so that we could go into this vortex and communicate and connect with our higher power. However you see that, whatever form that takes. This is a time to turn inward. It's a time to ask for help.
help from whatever. Please lead me to the right medicine, to the right healers. Let me find the right attitudes. It's a time of prayer. Walk, talk, breathe prayer. That's what I say now. Yes, that's so beautiful. Oh my goodness. Everyone's going to love hearing that. I think that's exactly what everyone needs to hear. Have this vortex during this time to just connect within. And not only because we're quarantined, but because it is this time, this, you know, all these different religions are celebrating their religion. And what better time to have that connection be strong right now? I just. Absolutely. And it, quarantine is interesting because it forces you to go in. Well, what do I want to do now? I've got all this time. What am I going to do now? And now, and now. They take some time for connecting to the divine. It's there. It's around us in everything we do all the time. Just connect and please, I need some help. <laughs> you know, and pray for those who have died and pray for those who are ill and you know, open your heart. Prayer heals. We know that. We know that prayer heals. So this is really an extraordinary time on the planet. You can see it as a horrible time if you want, or you can see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to connect at the deepest, deepest level with what carries you forward in life. I really appreciate you taking the time as well and really sharing the simplicity of the chakra system as another way to health where we're not always looking at just my finger has this or <laughs> my ear or you know what I mean? Like to where you're really looking within and at what your your general fears or scares are. Am I, do I feel powerful? Do I love, you know? And that you have created remedies that we can just take to support that. Absolutely. That's what they are. There's support for, I always say, pick a medicine that's compatible with your higher consciousness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big one. Find the highest denominator, not the lowest. We're probably going to have to have you again <laughs> to, to talk more about your Oracle cards or something because you just have so much to offer to this world. But Thank you for being here today. Thank and is you. there, I know you said so much already to, for the world, <laughs> but is there any one last little thing you want to say to the world right now before this episode ends? Find your peace. Find your peace. It's Maybe. there. Find it and trust it. Just trust it. Because that is your immunity. That is your protection. Mm -hmm. And ask for what you need. It's always there. Be well. And good luck. This. this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ambika. Wow, that was really interesting. I know. You've, you're learning from her, right? Yes, from I am. I am learning the color, sound, um, and chakra homeopathy to add to my mix of tools. And I just love it because it's an easy way. We're all attracted to color. We use color, like how we paint our walls, what clothes mm -hmm. we wear. So it's very fun that that can really shift how you feel about yourself. Yeah, and I'm an artist. I love painting. So the fact that she's an artist and she's using color, not only in art, but to heal herself is just incredible. I just can, I'm, and she made these remedies herself which is even cooler. She's just an <laughs> alchemist, a healer. She's magical, truly magical. And you can get all of her information of the classes or whatever she teaches since this is what more of a, it was more of a discussion of what's going on and how to heal yourself this episode. But that's okay. If, you, if you're interested, go check her out. And um, yeah, she does homeopathy. She does her color remedies. I know I think we should get a set of those cards. I mean, I just love the idea of how she did them and how she did them at a time when she was really kind of down. Mm -hmm. And then look, and they're beautiful. So we love Oracle cards. And again, if you're listening to this podcast, head to our YouTube to really get the glimpse and the visuals of what Ambika was showing us today. But yeah. And she uses condom water, which we didn't get to. So we'll have her again on this podcast. She uses condom, condom water in her remedies. I know. That was so interesting because we wanted to share Congen and so many of the healers we talked to already are aware of and drinking it. Yeah. So it's a very cool art of healing that we're in here. 
Yes. So thank you so much for listening and for joining us in this episode. If you liked what you heard, please leave a comment. Please leave a review. Like it. Share it with your friends and family. We welcome all the comments and concerns. We would love to hear from you guys. So thanks again for watching and have a great, safe day. Stay vibrant as much as you can.